Dutch-born Hank Rogers is perhaps one of the most important video game designers and entrepreneurs of the past 40 years, producing Japan's first major turn-based role-playing video game, The Black Onyx, and securing the rights to distribute the legendary Tetris on video game consoles, bringing the game to North America. Mr. Rogers and how he tried to convince former Nintendo of America president Minoru Arakawa to pack in Tetris with the Game Boy back in the 80s. This is Zermit with Celebrity Team. And so he said, why, why should I include Tetris? I have Mario, I can just include Mario. I said, if you include Mario, then Game Boy will be for little boys. But if you include, include Tetris, Game Boy will be for everybody. That choice is yours. Pixels and joysticks were just the beginning. After selling his mobile video game company, Hard Drop to the 2000s, Rogers founded Blue Planet Foundation, a public charity focused on fostering action for clean energy in Hawaii and beyond. And Blue Planet Energy, provider of energy storage systems that power homes, businesses, and critical infrastructure. Joining influential partners such as Peace Boat and EarthX for Climate Week 2022 in New York City, Z Prime caught up with Hank on what has influenced his desire to contribute something positive to energy and humankind. Hey there! Looks like we interviewed Hank Rogers. Just a heads up. You'll be seeing me a couple times to clarify things. You know, acronyms and such. See you soon! Basically, I draw on hats, uh, mostly on planes. Uh, this is the first time I had somebody embroider something on it. This is my slogan, 100% by 2045. Uh, my motto is that we are doing this. So this started in Lisbon. This is at the Oceans Conference. And this was one of the events, Rise Up. This is the Blue Planet. Venice, Santorini, Athens, Budapest. And this is, I didn't finish, Norway is supposed to be on here. And uh, I will start each trip with a white hat and end up with a painted hat or a tattoo on a hat, which I call a hat too. Who has influenced me most in my life? Oh my gosh. Um, so I guess it's got to be Gandhi, you know? Be the change you wish to see in the world. That's sort of, you know, my children made shoes for me that says be the change you want to see in the world. Um, and I took that to heart. So I can't just expect other people to do it or wait for somebody else to do it. You know, if I can do something, then I have to do it. That's the way I look at it. Um, Ideal world would be for us to fix everything by 2045. That's just full stop. Um, and as I talk to other NGOs or, other, or people, I ask, you know, what's the most important thing we have to fix? As many people as I talk to, that's how many things people come up and say, we have to fix that. And so it's not just one thing. You know, it's, it's nice to fix carbon uh, dioxide in the atmosphere, but something else is going to kick our butts, like refrigerants or, or who knows what. We, some things we haven't even discovered yet. If you go to the, the book Drawdown, the number one thing is refrigerants. It's not, it's not uh, airplanes. And nobody's even thinking about it or talking about it. So just to be on the safe side, we have to do all of them. That's just the way I look at it. The first iteration of Blue Planet is the Blue Planet Foundation in Hawaii. Um, I started in 2007 and, uh, you know, my background is I'm a computer game designer. Frankly speaking, I had no idea how to go about doing any of this. My mission at the time was to uh, end the use of carbon-based fuel. And so <clears throat> I, my mission for the foundation is to end the use of carbon-based fuel in Hawaii. Because Hawaii at the time is my home and I believe that you have to clean up your own room before you start asking other people to clean their room. Um, well, the, the biggest issue for me at the time was that I just had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know what, how we were going to do this. The electric company was the biggest company in Hawaii and they had a formidable political power. They controlled the PUC. They had their lobbyists, you know, in, uh, at the legislature. And, you know, as we were trying to pass laws to help the solar industry or, or whatever, they were always on the other side. Uh, so, finally we prevailed. We got Hawaii to have a mandate of 100% renewable energy by 2045. Um, and that was in 2015. Since then, 12 other states and, and uh, territories have copied our legislation, including California, Illinois, and New York, which is over half the population of this country. So, 
we are halfway there in this country. So uh, the thing w we did after that is we followed it up by changing the business model of the utility so they make more money um, by switching to renewable energy. So they went from being our worst enemy to our best friend because we helped them make more money. So that's what we need to do for, for every jurisdiction. We need to, first of all, create the political will and the, and the political will comes from the people, goes to the politicians. And then we work with them to figure out how can we, on a, on a business level, make it a uh, better business for whoever supplies them with the energy now to switch to renewable energy. Here's the issue. Um, you're looking for a specific example, like a turning point that exactly. made, me want to do, made me want to do what I'm doing. Um, my turning point was 100% blockage of the widow maker, which is a, the largest artery in your heart. So I got to think about the rest of my life after that, and I found my missions in life. And that's kind of, uh, how can I say, a wake-up moment for me, for me personally. Um, I didn't at the time know anything about, you know, le legal stuff or legislation or any of that. Uh, that all came to me as we, we started you know, forming a team uh, and figuring out how to do it. Um, at first we were, we were going to do a concert. <laughs> Thank God Al Gore did the concert for us. A concert and Al Gore. What are we talking about? Hank considered hosting a concert, including negotiations with Paul McCartney, to raise climate change awareness. However, he feared people would ultimately remember only the concert and not the cause. Then, Al Gore decided to launch his live Earth concert in 2007, which would have made the Hawaii concert duplicative and then we realized you know what uh, concerts very nice and it's like everybody's happy at the concert and they're motivated but when they go home it's like oh that was a nice concert it isn't like they go home and oh I got to change the world so we decided that we needed to become an action-oriented foundation and so since then I've always been looking for actions that we can take that will move the needle in the right direction So more recently, after the, after the foundation in Hawaii and our successes in the U.S., well, you can play it forward. If we're completely successful in the U.S. and we convert every state to do what happened in Hawaii, that's only 6% of the people in the world. So 6% of the people in the world aren't going to stop climate change. All the people in the world are going to stop climate change. So I moved to New York. I'm here in New York now. We have uh, a new organization called the Blue Planet Alliance. All NGOs, all companies, everybody that believes in our mission, which is to create a world in which humanity and nature live in harmony, are free to join us and work with us. That's the MOU. And now, it's a memorandum of understanding document describing the broad outlines of an agreement that two or more parties have reached. Although not legally binding, the most formal document that puts in writing the willingness of all parties to expedite the deal and move the contract forward. The MOU says we agree to work together to create a world in which humanity and nature live in harmony. Um, the first thing we're doing, of course, is doing what we did in Hawaii to other island countries. So uh, we've already done Palau, we're doing Tonga, we're doing Samoa next, we're going across the Pacific, then we're going to jump over to the Caribbean. I, I believe once it gets started and, and we see the results in one jurisdiction, how much money they save, I mean, these, these poor people, they're, they're the, the worst victims for climate change, they were not the cause, and they are paying through the nose for electricity. They, if, you, if you import diesel into your country or into your island, uh, people are paying as much as a dollar per kilowatt hour. And these are not people that have jobs manufacturing or something like that. They, were, they rely on stuff like tourism or fishing rights. It's just, you know, all of the money that they make goes to their addiction to fossil fuel. And uh, they all have some form of renewable energy available to them, whether it be solar, whether it's wind, uh, some places even have geothermal. Uh, these are all great energy sources. They're much, much cheaper than the fossil fuel that they're spending money on now and they become part of the solution rather than being part of the problem. People always ask me, do I have hope? And this is like, this is a question everybody asks everybody. Do, do you have hope for the future? 
And there's lots of pessimism around that, that question. And my answer is no, I don't have hope. I have determination. And everybody has to have determination. You know, I'm a, you know if you go back far enough, I'm a surfer. If you're uh, swimming, you're, you're trying to survive, uh, hope doesn't help you. I hope I get saved. No, this doesn't help you. You have to be determined. You have to say, no, I'm going to survive this. And that's got to be your, your focus. And humanity needs to have that focus. And that's, if I, if, if I can be known for something, it's, it's to get people focused on the end result and determination to actually get it done. I was on a panel um, in, in Hawaii at the, at the IUCN. It was the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And uh, I, had, I, on the panel, announced that we are going to go 100% renewable energy by 2045. And the guy next to me says, I'm a professor at the university. I study this for a living. There is no way we can go 100% by 2045. And I'm going like, what? what? You know, so I, I said, well, I'm not as smart as this guy, so we're going to do it anyway. And that's the answer. There's lots of people out there with lots of reasons why it can't be done, and we're going to do it anyway. They're already proud of me for what I've done in Hawaii. And they say, you know, why don't you rest on your laurels? But, you know, I, I, if, if I can do it in Hawaii when I started off and I didn't know what I was doing, I believe that I can do it for the rest of the world. It's, just, it's a bigger scale, but Hawaii was huge when I, when I started. Hawaii spends $5 billion a year on oil. That's the, you want to call it the enemy, or that's the problem. So by you know, stopping $5 billion a year of business, that is a hard thing to do. And if you think about how big the fossil fuel industry in the world is, that's, that's, it's really big. Um, I would like to be known as the one who, who flipped that and it made everybody believe that we're gonna go 100% by 2045 and followed up by actually making it happen. Um, my, what scares me is if I didn't work hard enough by the time that I actually leave the next time. That's, that's what scares me. It scares me that I, oh, I could have done more and I didn't. And I, you know, that's sort of the regret at the end of life. That's what really scares me. Oh, I'm late for uh, picking up our Burning Man stuff. 20% uh, of the burners come from New York. And uh, so they have arranged for people to be able to take stuff from New York to the burn pick it up at the burn, then you bring it back, and then the container is now in Jersey, so we gotta go pick up our stuff. Logistics. Logistics.